Hello, welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to use uh, the grid framework we had in the previous example, and we're going to combine it with the um, having an image available in our sketch uh, to create some interesting kind of animated textures. So this is where we left off in the, uh, the previous lesson. We have this uh, grid of squares that is being uh, that are being randomly colored using uh, colors from this uh, image of a highway interchange. So let's get rid of a few things here for this uh, this next sketch, and um, let's actually remix it so we have a uh, a new sketch to work from. So let's call this um, image grid. And this is going to be about generating textures from a source image. OK. <clears throat> so let's get rid of a few things in the sketch. Um, first of all, we are not going to draw this anymore. We're going, we're going to keep the, uh, the grid framework. So I'm going to keep these, uh, this for loop here. Um, But we are going to draw something different um, inside the, the grid. And we're also going to get rid of the, uh, the random colors because uh, we're doing a totally different example. Uh, we're also no longer going to generate this palette. And let's get rid of that. OK, so we're left with uh, our variable here that contains our file name, the grid size, which maybe we'll make a little bit bigger here for this example, um, and then our image variable. I'm also going to take no loop out because eventually we're going to create some animations in here. So just so we can see that our image is working, again, um, you can draw images using the image function. Uh, you pass it an image variable and then the position where you want to see your image. So this is the highway image that we're uh, working from that we have included as an asset, right? an asset here in our glitch uh, sketch. And uh, you'll notice when you remix a sketch, all the assets come along with it. So uh, it's a full copy of what we had to work with in the previous example. So let's start by taking this image. And what we're going to do is we're going to just draw that same image over and over in our uh, grid pattern. So I'm going to move that over here. Now, this is drawing the, the, the full image, right? And image is just like rectangle. It works from the, the corner by default. So let's switch that. We're going to say image mode uh, center. So this changes the coordinate that I give to my image function uh, to be the center of the <clears throat> the center of what I want to draw as opposed to the top left corner. So right now we're drawing the the full image, right? And that's why uh, we're only seeing we're seeing this kind of strange overlap here. Uh, so one thing we can do when we draw an image, we can also specify the size that we want this image to appear at appear to be. So let's put in grid and grid. So now it's it's drawing a smaller version of our image, right? And then repeating it over time in this in the the grid pattern. Now uh, another interesting thing we can do. Let's take a look at the p5.js uh, image function in the reference. So there's a few ways we can call image, right? So over here, this is how we're using it. We can say image, here's where I want you to draw that image, and here's the width and height I want you to draw it to. Um, there's also this, this other way we can use the image function. And that one is a little bit more confusing, so let's go over it for um, just for a few seconds. Um, so this other way of calling image takes on uh, takes two sort of sets of parameters. The first one is they call it the destination, and that is going to be where the image appears on the screen. So this is similar to when we use image by itself. So this is going to say, I want this image to appear at this coordinate and have this particular size. The other set of parameter here allows you to sample a region inside the source image, right? So we can see here, this is the source image. Um, so SX and SY is the top left corner, and then S width and S height is the size of the image that we're the sub image that we are sampling in the source image. So let's try this here in our uh, sketch that we are working on. Oh, let's go over there. <clears throat> so this is where the image is going to appear. So we're not going to change that. 
But then we could say, let's only take a subsection of the image. Let's say the section that starts at 0, 0, and that also has a grid as its size. So now what we're seeing is the top left corner of our source image, right? We're just seeing it uh, repeated here in the, the grid pattern. So this, is a, so this is a zone that we can move around. So instead of always starting from 0, 0, right? We can use our mouse, for example, to change. As I move the mouse, I'm going to sample a different subsection of my source image. So let's try that. We're going to create two variables here. Uh, I'm going to call this SX uh, to mimic the same names as in the reference. Uh, this is going to be a mapping. So we're going to use the mouse X coordinate as our input. And we know this varies between zero and width. Let's map it to a number between zero and uh, image dot width. Okay. So this is acknowledging that our image, right, may not match the size of our win of our browser. So this will allow us to sort of translate this range of motion I have for the the mouse here into the full uh, available area of my source image. And let's do the same thing with the y coordinate. Uh, except here we're going to map mouse X, a uh, mouse Y, which varies between zero and height. We're going to map this to image dot height. Okay. And then uh, in the for loop, we are going to use these uh, variables we just created. Instead of always sampling at zero zero, we're going to use that as our uh, source. Oops. I forgot a comma here. Okay. <clears throat> so now we can stop, start at the top left corner of our image, right? And as I move my mouse, you can see that um, here we're running out of pixels. So we'll talk about that in a second. Um, I'm kind of scanning through the original image, selecting a, a sub region, and then using that as my pattern in the grid. So that in and of itself is kind of interesting, right? You can sort of focus in on subsections of an image, repeat that, and that can be an interesting idea to explore for some uh, generative systems in and of itself. Depending on where we are in the source image, we can create interesting repeating textures. So we're going to take this idea a little bit further in this, uh, in this example. We're going to play around with mirroring uh, to create maybe a, a more of a continuous texture look. And we'll also look at animating uh, the cursor. Instead of having me move my mouse around, we're going to create some kind of automatic animation system so that we have these slowly drifting and evolving textures. Uh, but before we dive into this, let's take a second here just to really visualize what we're doing, because it may not be obvious uh, just from looking at me moving my mouse here. And visualizing it is also going to help us figure out how to fix this problem where, where I get to the boundaries I'm getting some black bars here. So let's talk about that. So the way I want to visualize this is, you know, because we are, we're in a programming environment, so we can kind of create whatever we want here. Let's draw in the top left corner uh, our original image, and then let's visually represent, you know, which section of it we're actually sampling from using our mouse cursor. So we're going to do this here. We're going to call this um, visualize the image subsection. And this will be just kind of temporary code to help us wrap our heads around what it is that we're doing. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to draw the image itself. We'll say image zero, zero. Okay. Uh, now remember we're in image mode center, right? So that's why we're getting it center. So let's revert back to image mode corner. Now, this image I'm using happens to be bigger here than I have space, and it's taking up um, all the, uh, it's taking up, taking over the sketch, and I don't want to do this. I just want this to take up a smaller section. So what we're going to do, instead of changing the size here, I'm going to use scale. And the reason we're going to use scale, I'm going to say 0 0.25 and 0 0.25. Okay? The reason we're going to use scale is that now that we've scaled everything by uh, a quarter, right, or 25% of the original size, I'm also going to be able to draw in this image the, the area that I'm sampling from using the same coordinates I have over here. 
And uh, this is just going to make everything I draw smaller. Okay, so we're going to be able to draw what we're sampling, make it smaller up here without having to do too many um, gymnastics with the math. Okay? So if I wanted to represent that sub-image over here, um, what I could do is take these coordinates that I'm drawing and then draw them on top of my original image uh, using an empty rectangle. So let's disable the fill and then we'll set a, a white stroke here and let's do a rectangle that's going to use SX and SY as its coordinate and then grid as its size because that's the same rectangle I'm using to sample in the source image. And that rectangle is a little bit, a little bit uh, hard to see right now. So let's make the stroke weight to be 10 so we can really see it uh, better. So you can see when I move my mouse around and then the white rectangle portion that we're drawing here is the subsection of the image that's being drawn and repeated. I'm also going to make this grid a little bit larger for our purposes here. Okay. So it's a bit easier to see. Um, so now we can have a visual representation of this area here that we're sampling from the image. So this is useful because we can see what happens when my mouse cursor moves all the way over to the right. right? So we're getting black because we're essentially, we're looking, we're now looking outside of our source image. So one way that we could fix this is we can just change the boundaries, right, when we do our mapping over here with S, X, and S, Y. Instead of going all the way to image.width, maybe we'll stop, right, by a factor of the grid size using minus grid and minus grid. So now if I go all the way to the edge, right, by changing the mapping, I can go from zero to image.width minus the grid size and then image.height minus, oops, minus the grid size. If I hang out too long with my cursor at the bottom, it shows me the desktop, so let's not do that. <clears throat> okay, so this is an interesting little tool that we have here um, that we can use to visualize what is happening with our, our subsection of the image here. Let's put a comment, we'll see. So remember, we remember that this means a subsection of the image. Uh, and then moving on, if we no longer want to have to see this, uh, we can we could put this into a function. Um, if we did, we would have to pass those parameters, at least these two, to the function. Or uh, we can be lazy right now. Uh, one thing we can do is just comment this out. So if you do control and then forward slash, uh, you can comment and uncomment blocks of code in uh, Glitch, which can be useful. So if we want to see our image, we can uncomment this code, and then if we want to go back to our composition, I'm just going to comment it, and now we're back to just seeing the grid. So let's keep playing with this uh, grid here a little bit and uh, make it more visually interesting. Uh, so one thing that we could do that's, uh, you know, it's a pretty common trope, is this idea of playing with reflections and kind of mirroring and symmetry. So right now we're seeing the same subsection repeated over and over. Uh, if we were to flip that section around and alternate how we flip it, uh, we can get some nice mirroring effects. And that's going to create the illusion more of a continuous image, uh, whereas right now the grid is really visible, right? Because we're only repeating the same, the same thing uh, over and over. So if you want to mirror things in, uh, in P5.js, what you need to work with is the scale operator. So the scale operator, you can use it, right? You can scale things. Um, you can, you know, double the size of something by scaling by two. You can also scale independently along the X and Y axis, right? So I could say, you know, stretch this along the X axis. Um, so let's leave it at a scale of one. Now, what happens when you scale by a negative number is there's actually a mirroring process that happens. There's a flip and it mirrors around the origin, which for us happens to be the center of one of our grid cells, so that's convenient. So if we wanted to say flip this around the um, the y-axis, right, do a or the x-axis, do a vertical 
flip. Um, if we make this negative, for example, you'll see that it's it's reversing the image um, on the x-axis. And I can do the same thing on the y-axis. right? So now it's flipping it upside down by doing minus 1. So what we need to figure out is a way to alternate these. So we want to say, draw one of the images um, normally, and then the next one, draw it flipped, so we can have this mirroring effect. So the way we're going to achieve this is, uh, let's make two variables. Well, let's start just with the x value, and then we'll add the y value on top. Uh, let's call this variable x scale. Okay? And we're going to assume that um, we're going to use that to set our scale here. <clears throat> so what we want to do here is we need some way of setting, you know, flip x scale to minus 1, right, every other um, column, essentially. So as we're repeating through the, the x values, we want a way that we can alternate and have one cell drawn normally, and then one cell drawn flipped, and then one drawn normally, one flipped. So a great operator to do this is the, uh, we're going to use the modulo operator. So modulo is the remainder of a division, if you don't remember it from uh, your processing class. And let's take a quick little parenthesis here through the developer tools and open the console, just so we can talk about uh, modulo. Yeah. <clears throat> so modulo is the remainder of a division. Okay, so if I have a number, let's say modulo 2, okay? so 0 modulo 2 is 0, okay? 1 modulo 2 is 1, 2 modulo 2 is 0, 3 modulo 2 is 1, 4 modulo 2 is 0, and so forth. Okay? So another way to think about modulo is it says the this percent sign operator here, is if you take a number, modulo some other number, right? it will always equal 0 when you get a multiple of what you are taking the modulo of. Okay? So if I say modulo 2, that allows me to check Right? If the result is 0, I can make something happen whenever the number coming in is a multiple of 2. Or if I say modulo 3, I can say if, check if the answer is 0, and if it is, I can make something happen whenever the um, there's a multiple of 3 of a particular number. So in our case here, uh, we can use that idea to look at multiples, right? x values, which are multiples of our grid size. So we want to say, do nothing when x is equal to 0. Right? Then when x is equal to 160, which is over here, we're going to check for, um, and we're going to use modulo to flip. Right? Then this one we want to ignore, do nothing. This one we want to flip. So let's write this as such. We're going to say, take a look at x, right? and look at modulo grid. Right? If that's equal to 0, that's going to say, that's going to trigger yes for every multiple of grid. So in other words, for every one of our grid cells, the answer of this is going to be zero. So we could say scale x scale equals minus one here. That's going to flip every single one of the cells. If we want to do every other cell, we can change the number here. We're going to say instead of grid, look at two times grid. So now every other grid cell, x modulo 2 times grid is going to be equal to 0. Right? So whenever we have, uh, we're going to have 0, right? then we're going to have 320, then we're going to have 640. So all of these multiples are going to result in a 0 here. And then we can do something that happens every other uh, grid cell. And we can see this reflected here in the behavior. So now we are mirroring our grid cell, but we're alternating. We're flipping between a scale of 1 and then a scale of minus 1. And we get this like much more interesting effect happening here. And we can do the same thing along the uh, y-axis. Right? <clears throat> Instead, we're going to look at our y variable. And because our grid is a square, we can do the same. We're going to flip our image along the y-axis. And then, of course, here we're going to put in y-scale as our um, variable. And then we can get 
um, these kind of psychedelic patterns that look like this. Uh, so it's still the same sub-image, except now it's being mirrored along the X and Y axis uh, in an alternating pattern. So the top left, there's no change, and then this is being mirrored, you know, right X only, both of them, Y only, and then that gets repeated throughout the grid. So we get a continuous looking pattern. <clears throat> and just so we can see here, uh, we haven't changed what sub-image we're sampling. All we're doing is just flipping it around. Okay. So we can see we're still just moving through our source image, but then we get to generate lots and lots of interesting textures uh, based on the content of the source image. So for our final step in this example, uh, we're going to go just a little bit further as well. We're going to animate this white square here that's moving around, sampling through our image. We're going to let it move just slowly by itself so we get an evolving texture instead of me having to control it with the mouse. And there's many, many ways we could do this. Um, <clears throat> but one way that we've learned about in previous uh, previous demos in this series is we can let we can get this the corner of this box here to move using uh, Perlin noise. That's something that we've looked at as a way of creating animation, right, of a point in the dancing line example. We've animated points, then connected them through lines. We can use the same idea here to animate this box that we're using to sample uh, a sub-image from our uh, original image. So let's see what that would look like. Move this over so we can see the code a little bit better. So here, instead of um, instead of making SX and SY, right, based on the mouse coordinate, I want to replace this with something that's going to be based on um, on Perlin noise. So let's comment these two variables out. Okay. Uh, so first, we're going to create a variable. Let's call it n, and this is going to be used to control the animation through the noise space. So if you remember, if you sample Perlin noise always using the same input, you're going to get the same value back. So we want to have some kind of offset that allows us to move through the noise landscape. And an easy way to generate that offset is to use frame count. And we're usually going to want to divide that by some amount because um, just a number going up by one is going to have these huge jumps through the Perlin noise space, and that's going to basically look completely random. Uh, so let's start with a, just some arbitrary number here. This is a number we've called res in the Perlin noise examples, and you can think of it as the resolution of our noise, like how zoomed in we are, how slowly are we moving through that noise uh, by using this division factor. So let's make an X coordinate based on Perlin noise. So we're going to say map the noise value at N, right? So this number is going to be going up over time. So we're going to be moving up and down through the noise. Map this number, which is always going to be between zero and noise, uh, zero and one. Sorry. So Perlin noise just returns a number between zero and one. We're going to map this number uh, to a number between zero and image dot width minus grid. So much like we were doing with the mouse cursor here, the only difference is now the input is not the mouse. The input is going to be a noise value. And then let's do the same thing with uh, the Y coordinate. We're going to map. And then here it's going to map using image dot uh, height and not that width, of course. OK. So now we can see uh, I've left the little visualization here um, uncommented. So we can see our square is now moving by itself based on Perlin noise. But it's always going to be moving along a diagonal. Okay? Uh, it is animating our texture, so that's kind of interesting. But the square is moving along a diagonal. And that's because we are using the same noise value right, for both x and y. So if we think about it, these two will always be the same because they are moving together. So the way we solve that in previous examples is we can just add an arbitrary offset to this n value here, which just means just jump ahead in this in the noise space, which is infinite. And that offset is not really super important. Um, here I'm just going to arbitrarily add 100 so that now we're using the same noise function, but we're sampling at two different places, right? moving at the same rate using n, 
but the Y values are coming from 100 values down the road. And as a result, we're going to get a coordinate that's now no longer having the X and Y component moving together. Instead, they're just kind of appear to be randomly drifting around, um, drifting around the image like so. Another interesting thing we could add to this um, is we could also make this, this square here. Uh, we can have the size of this area that we are sampling from. Um, right now, we're, it's, we're just using grid right throughout. This is our, our grid size, and we've used this same size here as the sampling area. But we could deviate from this, and we could, we could, we could modulate the size of this subsection also using noise so that it will, over time, get shrink and grow in this kind of organic fashion. So let's create a variable. Uh, I'm going to call it uh, Z for zoom. Okay? And we're going to map the same noise, right? And we're going to sample it from somewhere else again, so it doesn't look the same as our other two values. This is going to be, um, instead of a, a coordinate, we're going to map the zoom value, just let's say for now, a number between 0 and 100. Okay? And then we can treat that as an offset. So when we um, sample here in our image, instead of grid, we're going to say grid plus zoom. And then we'll say grid plus zoom okay, in our sub-image. Uh, sorry, I did not call this zoom. I called it z. We'll say grid plus z. And then in our little visualization, we're also going to say grid plus z so we can see the real effect that we're having. <clears throat> so now this, uh, this square area that we're using to sample is also going to change over time. It's going to get bigger or smaller. And uh, as a result, this is also going to vary the size of the pattern here we're seeing. Uh, so this is going to change over time as well. Now, it will mean that as this gets bigger, um, it will exceed, probably, eventually, if we leave it run enough, it will exceed the boundaries of our image. So we're going to get the black bars again. Uh, so one way we could account for this is uh, we could calculate the zoom first. And then um, the amount that we're going to subtract here is going to be grid plus z to make sure we don't go beyond the boundaries uh, of our image to begin with. So if we're grabbing a bigger square, right, we want the x and y coordinate to stop a little bit sooner. And then just to demonstrate what happens when we tweak this number here, uh, if we this, you know, the bigger this number, right, the faster this square is moving across this random Perlin landscape. And then the slower it is, you know, the slower the motion. Um, now I've made it, you know, 10 times slower than it used to be. So it practically looks like we're at a standstill, um, but it is still moving and shrinking. So we, we can really control um, the pace here of this algorithm uh, by playing with this, uh, this number over here. So this number, you know, we're not going to do it in this exercise, but now we've done it. We've done it in a lot of the demos. Um, this could be interesting to add controls here using that GUI, uh, so we could tweak this number in real time. Uh, maybe we could tweak tweak the grid size, right? How much of a a zoom factor we're creating? Uh, for example, these would all be interesting values to have control over as the program is generating these textures. Uh, so we could kind of explore the results here a little bit. All right, so I like this uh, this slow pace here. Um, this is going to create this sort of slowly drifting image um, that's you know creating abstract geometric patterns from an input um, an input image. So I'll link to this uh, finished program down below if you want to experiment for yourself. Uh, maybe try a different asset, right? Try uploading different images through this to see what kinds of results you could get. And um, 
maybe apply other strategies uh, for the grid here. I use this mirror idea, um, but there's lots of other things we can explore with that concept. Uh, but the idea here is to treat the image um, not as something we're going to draw directly, but more as a, as a source of pixels that we can manipulate and then use to create seemingly, you know, randomly evolving uh, textures and patterns. So that's it for this lesson. Um, I'll see you in the next one we, where we are going to use this, uh, this image now and tie it with the also Perlin noise and the concept of vectors uh, we saw in uh, a previous lesson to create uh, some other, other variation of a drawing machine. So I'll see you there.